Welcome back everyone um, to our panel on how digital tools are changing science. This event is part of our Nobel Prize initiative, Inspiration Initiative here at Austin. I am Allison Preston. I'm the Interim Vice President for Research and a Professor in Neuroscience and Psychology here at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm very pleased to be here with our three laureates, Elizabeth Blackburn, Andrew Fire, and Robert Grubbs. So thank you for joining us today. Um, for the audience, as you enjoy our discussion, we encourage you to please submit your questions, which we'll answer um, during our live um, Q&A at the end of our session. You can do so by uh, entering your question into the box at the right of your screen. So I thought today um, we could start out by talking about what digitization and digital tools mean to you. So maybe Elizabeth, if you can start out by just sharing you know, how you feel like the digitization computer revolution has changed science in your field, where it's made the biggest difference, maybe even talking about um, some advances in your field that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Sure, I, I think there's, two aspects there's a huge plus and then there's 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 a potential loss and, and i'll try and cover yeah. both of those uh, the huge plus of course is that now we have literally at our fingertips in biology vast troves of information which range from you know complete dna sequences of you know thousands of different or many thousands of different organisms and variations within species we have huge amount of information on it, how genes are expressed, huge amount of imaging. And that is one part of the science that has just made so many more questions accessible and asking questions in different ways that were never possible before, now, now possible. Um, my research is, is sort of an interesting juxtaposition of I fundamentally come from molecular biology, but I interact a lot with people who work with um, human studies all the way from you know human clinical related studies to how human um, policies affect our health. And right. we try and meet this um, with how this affects something which is to do with the cells that uh, we all have in our bodies and which contain the chromosomes and whose ends need protection and we can measure end protection losses um, in very quantitative ways. So all of this also relates to the kinds of studies you can do in very large numbers of, of people. And we've seen, you know, things like enormous biobanks in Britain, which have enabled us to quickly get at questions at a scale we would never have been able to get to in terms of human health and disease processes. Uh, so this was well before the pandemic, although this has become very marked during the pandemic. So the kinds of questions you can ask and the, f the framing of them has dramatically changed in, in biology and it's the enabling technology. Now, I'm just going to touch for a moment on the minus. There is so much possibility there and we can be overwhelmed. And what I think we have to consciously keep very active is this whole framework of just trying to think about um, how to, what is, what is really going on? What is the underlying mechanism? Not just getting more data about something, but what, what really is the deep understanding for processes in, in mm -hmm. biology? ways that we got very good at asking when we didn't have such technologies. So I think that's a very important part of training, which is we need to keep that thinking human mind very actively um, engaged because it's very tempting just to just wallow in this marvelous fields of all the <laughs> digital data that we can get in, in biology. So that juxtaposition, I think, is, is a very fascinating, exciting part of research now. Yeah, it certainly opened up a many doors, right, into inquiry that it hadn't otherwise. And so balancing, right, the theory, like the classic theory with the new opportunities kind of have to meld. Well, hopefully not the classic theory. I'm hoping that this will be new ways of thinking, well, you, that you, you, would, to, yeah. you would engage yeah. in new ways of thinking using the data, but yeah. not just be, um, you know, so overwhelmed by the data that, that you really need some daydreaming time when you, that amazing computational thing called our brain can really start <laughs> making extraordinary kinds of creative and imaginative um, uh, leaps that we still need to have in something as complex as biology. Yeah. Andrew, do you have thoughts on, on you know, how digital tools have changed your field too? Yeah, I mean, what Liz says, to tell, I, I should maybe just give a past, present and future view of it. When I was a graduate student, 
um, often experiments that now take a few hours would take weeks. And there were things yeah. that the, the most striking was the one that would take six hours. We used to, we used to separate DNA to look at it on, the, on something called a gel. And you'd pour the gel like six times and it would break the first five times and then it would work. And then you would start <laughs> running it. Um, and then you had six hours off not to do anything. You couldn't really do anything in that time on that experiment. And so people would go and get coffee and talk to each other. And, you know, that, that sort of was a, was a downtime that was there. Then when you submitted a paper for publication, you would mail it to the journal, which was in England at the time, Journal of Molecular Biology, um, airmail, of course, to get it there in a couple of days. And then they would get the paper review. They would send it back uh, uh, ship mail to a reviewer, probably in the U.S., and get the reviews back, maybe airmail. Then they would they would ship it back by you know to you. They would send a, a letter by standard post, which would go on a boat from from uh, the U.K. here. And so it took a couple of months to just do the transfers then. And you know that meant you had to think during that time about what else you were doing. Um, and it still takes a long time to review a manuscript. It still takes a lot of, there, there's still a lot of things that take time in science, but we don't always use the time to just chat and to think about other things to, that we can do during that time. Um, and so I, I do miss the idle time somewhat in science. Not that it, it's not great to be able to do things quickly, not that it's not great to already have an infinite amount of data facing you that you could analyze with your time, but there was an advantage to having that idle time. And I think, I hope that the future will be a combination of having access to a lot more data, but also having access to some un, unscheduled, undefined time and you know the ability to consider what could be valuable and ways to use that. Yeah, so I think, um, so let me ask you both, since you both struck upon this, like how do you build idle time into your day then, right? Like in the face of all this technology you can engage with and data you can think about, how do you structure your time? What would you advise the young students we're talking to, right, about how to, how to build that time into your schedule and to increase this kind of innovation and creative thinking? Go, go for a walk at lunchtime. And if you don't live in California and you have terrible weather, do something that my... Um, my Swedish German postdoc initiated, which was he called Fika, which is a three o'clock break in the afternoon when everyone would stop and have some tea or some cakes and sit in the lunchroom and just talk. And I think that kind of structure is, is absolutely wonderful. When I trained as a student, we had a cafeteria, a canteen in the MRC lab in Cambridge, and we used to just go and talk at lunch times and morning and coffee times. And so I think simply structuring those things into your day, be it lunchtime or a break in the afternoon, that's that's a very simple way of of, of doing it. Well, Robert, how is, you're in a, not in the field of biology or chemists, right? So how, how has mm. digital tools impacted your specific field? I mean, it's changed everything. I mean, I mean, the key to uh, the key to being fast. I'm an organic chemist, and the key to our movement is when you make a new molecule, what's the structure, and mm -hmm. uh, and and being able to determine that rapidly determines how fast you can move. When I started out, we had infrared spectroscopy, which was a few little blips on a thing. It was really difficult to know. The the growth in NMR, which is all tied to uh, to being able to have much more powerful computers, so one can now get structures in minutes uh, rather than weeks and days and maybe forever. So that really opens up the number of questions you can ask. Uh, and it also opens up the number, uh, how fast you can do experiments, which, uh, which, which is tough. You know, and so, and so that's in a liquid state. And, you know, and in biology, it's had a huge effect in being able to look at the relationships between atoms and space. In the solid state, uh, when I started out, there were only a few people in the world who could do X-ray crystallography, and they mm -hmm. did them all. Now sometimes we can do X-ray crystallography faster than we can do we can do an NMR, and uh, and my colleagues are now working on techniques where we don't even have to grow a crystal anymore. You essentially you know scrape stuff Simulate out of the it. bottom of a flask. Yeah, yeah. no, no, you you know you basically uh, do uh, lots and lots of uh, X-ray uh, electron diffractions, and then you put them ever all um. together. And so so now that's a huge area. Uh, the other thing is in theory when you know. Theory uh, finally is getting to the point where it can help us do experiments. Uh, it's been really powerful and it's been and it's gone a long way. But in terms of dealing with really complex systems, 
uh, which is what we do, uh, recently has been a huge help in trying to make it happen. So in theory, so we don't have to do as many experiments anymore. And then the other place has been in information. So mm -hmm. now I'm working in lots of different areas. And so it really liberates you to have a, have a crazy idea and then you can go check it out really rapidly. In the old days, you had to go to the library and dig through Beilstein and you know all these books around and everything. Now it's you do you can look at Wikipedia and you've got to start. So so I think that's the other place which allows really is liberating in terms of kinds of areas that one can think about and uh, and start to do experiments in. I mean I, I've got a whole separate area of research where I'm working with clinicians at UCSF. Uh, on solving medical problems, which mm -hmm. I can now do because I can get information very rapidly about uh, you know, what's going on. Well, that, that actually touches upon one of the questions I wanted to ask you, like not only the tools you do to use your experiments, but how, you know, digital tools like the ones we're using now, right? And we've all been using consistently yeah, right, through the yeah. pandemic. And how, how has that impacted how the size of your lab in the sense that your lab trans, you know, transcends the boundaries of your physical space, right? We are building bigger teams and you know, collaborating with different kinds of individuals. I wonder if each of you have experiences along those lines that you know, how you've done science and who you've interacted with has changed as a function of the digital modalities that we now interact with. Andy, do you have, have comments along those lines, thoughts? I mean, I, what you're saying is true. It's wonderful to be able to interact across international boundaries and across continents. But, you know, at the end of the day, really the most important interactions really are in the, in an immediate space and area. And, you know, I think it's been, it's been a picture of how important that is over the last mm -hmm. year, um, both the, the interactions that one has in meetings in person and the interactions that one has in let's say a lab group where people are all working in the same space and interacting with each other and having lunch together and chatting together informally. And I think that we should be recognizing the value of that as we move forward. And not that we can't do a lot of things on Zoom, but the, the, the value of having people in the same place, talking to each other informally, running into each other, the, those, those random collisions does have, does have a value. Yeah. And so I, I would say, Absolutely, there's tremendous value in being able to work through Zoom, email somebody, work through Zoom, have a conversation with them about a specific topic. But there's also a value in not having an agenda and being able to talk through with people ideas that wouldn't fit into an agenda. Elizabeth and Robert, do you have you know thoughts on on how we can the way that digital tools actually, you know, enter our collaborative space and how to use those appropriately, balancing them with the thoughts that Andy has about maintaining, inter, you know, the in-person interactions is critical to science. Yeah, I mean, I Absolutely. agree. I, I think, yeah, good. No, Bob, go ahead, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to say it. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead, Elizabeth. It's important go ahead. to have those. You know, as humans, we do so much amazing communication uh, in ways that Zoom can't quite capture. And, and so I think it's going to be really important to very deliberately, in a proactive way, make these kinds of things happen because the default is so easy to have a Zoom, to have a, have a you know, a, a digital interaction, uh, you know, as email used to become so easy and we realized its inadequacies inadequacies. Now we, we, mm -hmm. we see Zoom is terrific and it's really easy, but we're also realizing it's, inac you know, it's inadequacy. So we have to start thinking, okay, we have to build in certain kinds of things. Now, I signed a pledge that I would not go flying off to conferences and giving lectures all over the world, using up, you know, valuable, um, uh, I mean, sorry, producing a carbon footprint, which was frankly unnecessary. So I said, I'm not right. going to do that. But in a very, very limited way, I think it's important to do in an extremely limited way some interactions with scientific colleagues. So that's going to require proactive thinking to meet both of those things. Because I've, one of my experiences is, is that once you've had a real person-to-person -person interaction with somebody and you've spent some time with them, somehow all the subsequent interactions with them are much, much richer than if you didn't have that before one. And so it's a really good investment of time. And I found with collaborations, 
of which I've been fortunate to have many with, um, you know, medical and social science and other collaborators, is that that initial conversation where you, you know, sit and eat, eat something together and, and really talk, that then set the stage for what could be digital things. So I think we've got to be proactive and say, let's make that time, not only for free thinking and daydreaming and chatting, but also <laughs> that person to person. And it'll pay off because we can then exploit much more effectively the digital tools that we all so easily can have access to. Yeah, I think that's sage advice. Robert? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I agree. It's, I, I think we were much too far the other way before. You know, it, it was, it, it was standard for to jump on a plane and fly to San Francisco and meet for two hours and fly back home again or fly to the East Coast. I lived on airplanes. Uh, it's been very <laughs> liberating this year not being on an airplane since last February. Yes. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think now, now, now we know. We didn't know before. I think now we know. And so I think we can now start to move back toward a good balance of, of the personal interactions. And it is good to sit down in a room and get the get the feel for folks, and I, that's really, really important. But I think also, uh, as you say, we need to cut down our carbon footprints and spend more time thinking. And I've had a lot more time to think this year than uh, sitting on an airplane or sitting in an airport uh, hibernating. Uh, so, so, so I, I, yeah. And so I think we've learned a lot this year. I do too. Um, so maybe thinking about, you know, young scientists who might enter your fields, how has the field, you know, changed to evolve? Like how has the introduction of these digital computational, right, tools changed how your students, postdoctoral fellows train, right, to do the kind of science you do now? Um, you can imagine being, you know, you as a graduate student, right? How is that different from the experience of your graduate students, for instance, that you work with now? Robert, do you have, you have thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's very different. Again, again, I think I think most of the the deal is 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 being able to get information and find find information and find it rapidly. Uh, all the tools now are getting pretty. Uh, you, know, you don't have to be a, a a a computer expert to be able to run an NMR anymore or most instrumentation. And so things are getting much easier that way. So so that aspect hasn't changed as much. I think also understanding theory and understanding how to do that. Uh, it's much more uh, programmed into the research. But I, I think the, ba the basic line for our field is information, where to find it, how to get it, how to get information rapidly, uh, how you check ideas, and how you decide if it's worth trying, et cetera. So, so I, I think the information part's really, really been the big, big difference. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, you know, we, we thrive on being able to do experiments and think of experiments and go ahead and do them that that's very wonderful um i i think that everyone can learn that there's a there's a there's a two aspects of learning that are very important for people coming into science one is learning to use the tools that are there that are computational tools the other is learning to build your own tools which is going to happen at some point so i think Everybody coming into science should learn a little bit of programming, not because they're going to write the next Google or Facebook, but because they're going to have questions they want to answer that will be facilitated by working with a computer as a tool. And then finally, there's a benefit to understanding what computer scientists have learned about human communication, about the nature of information, about the nature of data. And not that then, again, not that one makes a contribution as a computer scientist, but it's useful to see how that information um, study how that information um, methodologies have gone in relation to how biology works or chemistry for that matter um, and so i do think there's a benefit in in learning to use the tools that are out there that are wonderful learning to make your own tools and then learning how how tools are created and how the the, the structure and the and the the understanding of of information theory works and that that i think is fascinating from the point of view of biologists and there are a lot of lessons Elizabeth, do you have advice for young scientists thinking about how to train now and, and how the field has evolved as a function of digitization? Well, well, yes, I think because, you know, the digital natives <laughs> really can start from a much, much more advanced place than many of us coming in, you know, from a later generation, we've had to sort of catch up with this. 
that is putting people in this terrific position of being able to say, well, what is the, the you know, real advances come from saying, what is a technology that can now open up the possibility of asking questions that were never asked before. And so that means you really need to be coming very much more adept in these digital, so, oh no, digital is a catch-all word, but it, you need to be very adept in this. And so that sort of training, I think, is going to become more and more emphasized in, in scientists, whether they've got it in high school or undergraduate, but that's really, really crucial. But then the idea of saying, what is the new set of doors or avenues that have opened up because some new technology has happened. Certainly it was true when I was, you know, training as a, as a student and then as a postdoc, suddenly the very beginnings of DNA sequencing were opening up and I could use these then very primitive tools to answer a question that was, you know, unanswered before. So now there are different questions you can, you can ask. And so that juxtaposition of really keeping in mind a lot of critical thinking and sort of creative thinking with, you've got to master a lot of these technologies. I think that's the shape of, um, you know, training now. And so even if you don't think you're a computer scientist, as, as was discussed, it is much more straightforward now to use many of these tools. But you want to have to, you want to think about what are the kinds of questions that nobody's really thought of asking, but I can now come in and ask. Yeah. So with that, I maybe can ask each of you to speculate where the thing, technology is going to take your your fields in the future, right? What do you see on the precipice of being the forefront of each of your respective fields? Maybe Robert, you can start us off. Thoughts about yeah, yeah, I was just, where where do you think chemistry will be five, ten years from now? Well, it'll, it'll still be the place it is, but we'll have a lot more tools. And uh, as I say, I, I think structural characterization will just keep getting faster. Uh, a new field that's moving in is is uh, artificial intelligence applied to understanding chemistry and understanding reactivity uh, and starting to make predictions. And, you know, what's been interesting there is that the people who are moving into that field now and trying to go back and mine old data is that all we published in the past were things that worked. When you get into uh, artificial intelligence, you need to know what didn't work. And so I think there's now going to be interesting new ways of thinking about designing experiments so you can, you can define the parameters much better so that it fits into an intellectual, uh, into, a, into a being able to analyze it in a much better and faster way uh, and actually getting to useful results instead of having to depend completely on sitting down and drawing pictures forever. Uh, I think it's really gonna help and probably speed things up. Probably gonna take part of the fun out of it because I like the, sort of leaps of faith that if artificial intelligence can probably help maybe with that. Yeah. Andy? I guess I don't, I mean, we talked about this, where I don't know what the future is going to bring and it partly the audience will be the, 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 yeah. uh, the agents which bring, who bring change to the, to the world. Um, I hope that it's a positive thing. I hope that, that we, enable ourselves to do more beneficial science and, and to explore more questions and to to help society with with what we do um maybe i should just leave it leave it at that and and leave it to the audience to 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 um go forward and and make change using a bunch of tools one of which will be digital and some of which won't won't be like crispr and 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 new organic synthesis means and all sorts of things we haven't even thought of yet Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts about where the future, what the future might hold? Yes, I, I think in, in biology, you know, all the way from, you know, the molecular to the to complex uh, ecosystems and, you know, ultimately sustainability of the, of the planet. I, I think we've now got the tools to do something that we couldn't really do before, and that is embrace the enormous complexity before, you know, the last century or so, you know, we, we had to sort of take things apart and try and reduce things to tool, using tools we had. And now, but we always knew that biology never really worked that way. It's just that we got a really great parts list and little cogs of how things fit together. But the whole complex interactive dynamic, you know, life system that we have on the planet 
that's a complexity that I think we now start to have tools that we can really embrace this and not try to strip it down to, you know, reduced things, which were very useful to begin with, but they were the building blocks. Now I think we can embrace complexity. So I really hope that that's what, what will be happening. And uh, as was mentioned, you know, because that's what we will need to do. We will need to think about how to make the planet a more sustainable and fair place. And that means we will need to embrace how complex things really are. But we can start doing that because, you know, what we're calling digitization is, is allowing that. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, maybe we can use the, the pandemic as an example of this, right? Our ability to respond to, you know, our planet's needs, right? I, I don't know if you each have thoughts about how science and, and, and uh, those of us in the academy have interacted in this case with industry to help us, you know, meet the needs of the global environment currently and how that might be an example for the future, right? Elizabeth, do you have thoughts on this about how, how yeah. like this, this pushes us at the, the forefront of innovation, right? Like responding to crises, like, you know, the um, related to climate science, or in this case, the pandemic, how our ability to, you know, use digital technologies to quickly take innovations from the academy and put them out into the world and make them actually yeah. have yeah. world relevance. I don't know if you have thoughts about, you know, how digitization well, the is actually of the pandemic has been yeah. What a striking example this has been of taking all of the accumulated science from lipid chemistry to understanding how messenger RNA works in cells and putting it all together into this, you know, very rapid development of tremendously successful vaccines. And now we get to, you know, the complexity of how do we operationalize this and make it really effective so it can control the pandemic. So I hope that the pandemic acts as a real learning experience of mm -hmm. look at what you need to do, you know, all the way from investing in basic science to having ways that you can um, think of how it's societally applicable. And, um, you know, this is this is something that I hope we don't lose sight of because it's going to be more and more applicable to the long standing pandemic, which is the climate change or now, as we call it, the climate crisis. Uh, and so that's that's the real pandemic that is threatening to overwhelm us now, I think. Yeah. Robert and, and Andy, do you have thoughts about how we can, you know, how digitization has allowed us the us to respond more quickly to the questions and crises like posed by our world? There have been certainly some wonderful positive examples over the pandemic of the ways technologies has, have moved us forward, whether it be in biotech or, or computing. Um, we also have faced some challenges that, that we could be better at, um, you know, from, you know, not being able to roll out the tests that we wanted at the time we wanted. And, you know, can we do better with um, understanding what communities need, different communities need in the, in the uh, conditions of a pandemic? Um, and to, to the interface between climate and health as well, which is played into it. So I think there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of basic questions. There's a lot of applications needed that have come that have come into focus from this, and we'll be figuring it out for years to come. I hope that we don't have another crisis of this cal of the scale immediately, because I think it will take a while to for science to recover. And it's been, you know, it's been a, a bit of a hit in the last year in the sense that that we have lost some. Uh, time in a lot of projects, some of which don't have to immediately to do with the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, but we, which do have to do with human health and, and the environment. And we really will need to make up lost time in those cases too. So we're not in a position where we're, we're, we're vulnerable in other, other circumstances. Well, thank you all for being with us here today and talking about how digital tools have impacted science across all of your fields. Um, I think we've learned some lessons about, you know, they've opened, while they've opened up a lot of doors, there's still some aspects of in-person interactions and deep thinking that we need to participate in too. So I think those are great lessons um, for our audience. And so we'll have a brief break now and we'll transition to our live Q&A panel. So please um, submit your questions via the portal to the right of your screen. So thank you for being here today. Welcome to our live Q&A session about how digital tools have impacted science. 
I'm Allison Preston, the Vice President for Research and a Professor in Neuroscience and Psychology here at UT Austin. And I'm joined by my colleague, the Dean of Natural Sciences, David Vandenbelt. And we'll be moderating this live Q&A session with you today. And you'll have the opportunity to pose your questions to our three laureates, Elizabeth Blackburn, Andy Fire, and Robert Grubbs. And so throughout our Q&A session, you can continue to submit your questions via the, the box to the right of your screen. Um, and you know, we'll get started. So we're excited to hear what you have to ask our laureates today. So our first question actually asks uh, one from a personal perspective. So Teresa posed a question is that digital tools make it much faster for us to do science, right? So they allow us to compute things more quickly, but she asks why then we still work such long hours, right? Why haven't we used this increased efficiency to help improve our work-life balance? So I don't know if, you know, Andy, you want to speak to that first about how you've approached, right? The increasing um, pressures that digital tools put in our lives. I, that's a really good question, and I think we need to, to look at that. I mean, partly the um, the limitation in experiments pre-massive digital tools was that you could only do a certain amount, and um, it becomes, you can only be physically in lab a certain amount of the time. Now you can get an infinite amount of data and just be swimming in it and be lost in it. And so I think it sets up a different, slightly different kind of scientific challenge, which is how to get the data that we need, how to interpret it in ways that we need to know about it, and also how to acknowledge that there may be lessons in the data that we're getting that we can't um, unpack at the moment, and then go ahead and publish it. And while you're doing it, take some time out to be a person. Um, Elizabeth, how, how do you think about that question about you know, the increased speed of science balancing off with the time we spend doing it. Yeah, it's it's almost looking like a double-edged sword because there's, there's just so many wonderful things you can do, you know, either in the lab that will then generate material that can then be, you know, fodder for a lot of digital data. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I found it hard almost to um, get, folks in the lab to, to actually stop doing things that generate lots of data. And I would plead and say, please take some time and just look at what you've got so far, because normally that process happens a lot when you're preparing a scientific publication. That's when you're stopping and mm -hmm. scrutinizing and looking at the data. And, and I kind of wish that we would build structures in so that we would say, okay, you know, there's a certain time I don't know, every week where I'm just going to just look at all the material that I've accumulated experimentally and, and really think about it. Because the temptation, because you can, is just to keep doing more because yeah. the barriers to doing more and getting more data have dropped because the technologies have become so, so wonderful. So I don't, um, you know, I think we have to kind of build some uh, expectations into science and some culture into science where it's not, you know, fully virtuous just to be working 15 hours a day and accumulating more and more uh, information, which we can do with so many technological tools now. But I don't know, I don't know how to do that, excepting individually to urge people that you work with to, to do that. But um, that's yeah. what I've noticed is, is a big change. Yeah. David, do you want to take over? Yeah. So, so Bob, I wondered if you could give us a, a perspective on kind of another question of a double-edged sword. So this is from Patrice, and, and that want to know, um, to what extent is technology an answer to the climate crisis, or does our increasing reliance on technology simply drive up our demand for energy? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I I think the faster we can solve problems, the better they're going to be, and the more advances we're going to make. And so I'm really hoping to do that. Uh, you know, using modern technology really doesn't use all that much energy. Uh, what uses a lot of energy as scientists is flying places and getting on airplanes and having all kinds of meetings. And I think, uh, you know, the technology as we've learned this year allows us not to do that, allows us to have meetings without having to, to get on a 
very dirty airplane and fly long distances to be able to interact and have, have solutions. And so, so I think, you know, as the technology develops and we learn how to use it better, I think it's actually going to have a, a big influence on at least the science contribution and then in terms of solving with anything and and some of the some of the technology advances will will drive up demand and we have to be aware of that and, and and control it i do think there's a benefit to people being in the same space and it's worth not necessarily completely eliminating all in-person meetings but understanding the value that that in-person meetings have and trying to take advantage of that if you're going to get a bunch of people together um, at a venue to talk about climate change or COVID or anything um, Let's do it in a way that the information really is um, fundamentally exchanged and people interact with each other. Not have people just sitting in a room listening to a lecture for eight hours a day, but have them having a chance to interact with each other, get to know each other, forming collaborations, understanding where each other are coming from. That can really be a benefit and there's a, there's a huge um, human, human aspect to where being in the same room is different from being on Zoom. But let's take advantage of the carbon that we use to move people around to really make sure that those those interactions are 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 part of what happens at a scientific meeting or any other any other choice to 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 move around the world. If someone's a tourist, make sure that you really understand and make a bond with the people of wherever you're going. I think that's a, a lesson that I hope to draw from from the combined the combined crises of of climate change and COVID. Alan, so, you want to move I on think, to yeah, I think this raises another question raised by Mo, and this is something, Elizabeth, that you touched on in our recorded session, the fact that technology can be used for good and bad, right? There are actually ethical considerations when considering how technology has impacted science. So Mo's question is, how do we increase the chance that we use technology in beneficent ways, right? How do we use it for good and make sure that we're um, maintaining appropriate ethical boundaries with technology? Well, I think um, it's it's partly the um, yeah it's it's how you use it. You know, we can't say it's technology itself that's bad. I like to say, you know, a pencil is a very useful thing, but you can also use it to jab somebody's eyes out. I mean, you know, so the reason we don't do that with pencils is because of societal and you know, sort of personal um, ethical uh, values and so forth. So it's interesting that I think. The um, ability to have technology is is only a, only a part of it. It's really the how how do we uh, agree to use it? And as scientists, I think we do have some real agency in implement. You know, we can implement certain things that we will agree to work on as scientists if we see that a technology or the application of it is being used in ways that we just no is not right. And, you know, all humans have pretty much an inbuilt ideas of what is and isn't sort of good and right. You know, there's a lot of agreement uh, uh, overall about what is going to harm others and what isn't. And I think as scientists, well, we, can, we can make some real decisions ab about that. Yeah. Uh, but well, often I'm, technologies, I'm, I'm, we, we won't know where they'll go. They, you know, technologies can lead to very unexpected directions. So I wouldn't hold back on them. But as I say, there are certain applications that I think we can, as scientists, agree that as 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 a scientific community, those are things that just wouldn't be the right kind of things to do in terms of their possible harm to hu other humans. And let's well, maybe I can it ask to, a specific question. You know, the planet. Yeah, maybe I can ask both you and Andy this because you both right are in the field of genetics and you think about this. So that maybe you can talk about how you think about it in your own sphere of scientific study. Like we have much more capacity to study the genomes of individuals and, and people. So what are some of the ethical quandaries that you experience in your field that technology has given rise to and how do you negotiate it? What are the kind of the ethical contracts that you've thought about in your fields and, and to solve these problems? Andrew, have you thought about, you know, do you have anything that you want to I mean, speak to there's a lot of thoughts on that, and I don't know that I'm in, in, at all an expert in it. I think there's, you know, at the, 
end of the day, one of the major ethical responsibilities as we have as genetics with such powerful tools is to explain what they can and can't do um, to people. We're not going to cure all disease with genetic understanding. We're, we're going to get an incremental understanding of a lot of, of conditions and perhaps ways to, to focus research and focus our, our efforts, but it's not going to be a, a miracle cure for things. And I think that's a very important thing to, to understand as geneticists. And I, I hope that the field will, will move forward with that. Um, there's also a, a responsibility to, to, at the very edges, you have um, the possibilities, and it's still, I think, a, a somewhat remote possibility of being able to be do it safely, of being able to change the genome in the germline to change future generations. And I think I would, mm -hmm. I would hope that the world approaches that with a lot of concerns. It, it goes much beyond yeah. science. It's not something that as scientists we should be deciding on, but it's something that should be very carefully thought of. At the same time, there's opportunities to change what happens in our everyday cells that's not part of the future germline, the future germplasm of the species. It's just a way to keep people healthy and we're responsible, I think, to explain how there are benefits that can be had from that. Um, there are responsibilities to explain what the dangers could be of manipulating organisms of the environment like plants and of the benefits of that. I think we're going to need to use genetic manipulation of plants to feed everybody in the future. Um, people that are starving are not going to care whether recombinant DNA was used to make a plant because it doesn't make it any more dangerous or any safer for that matter. But I think we need to explain that very carefully so that the, when the, the tools become available and when they're needed, which they will be in almost every area of agriculture, people understand them and they can work with them. Yeah, I think this was some great insights about how to think about these problems thoughtfully and communicate them. David? So, so Bob, I have a question from Nate, which involves thinking about technology and how you stay ahead in the field. Um, and, you know, one question is, uh, as you think about balancing resources, to what extent is it important to focus on keeping up with the latest and greatest in technology versus investing in human capital. Um, and we can obviously fall way behind by just doing nothing but, but using funds to, to support people, or we can also have equipment that uh, you know, is the latest and greatest, but we've lost our chance at, at training a generation of scientists. So, so how do you see that balance? Yeah, I mean, that always is a, is a question of, of how you manage that. And, uh, yeah, and so fortunately, I'm in a field where uh, where there, there's a lot of manpower needed, and technology changes and grows. But and and so that's always the problem. Fortunately, there are sources of funding for instrumentation which doesn't compete with personnel stuff. And so usually, you know, that's the way it is. You have your personnel stuff, and a look for in smaller sort of technology things is for the big pieces, you have to go sort of buy those independently and raise funds for those. So, so in many cases for the big things, it's really not a competition, it's, uh, it's that. But yeah, if, if I have a choice, I usually go for manpower uh, and if I'm forced into making a decision, but, uh, and, and, you can, and you can usually find someone who has the, the piece of instrumentation that you need to uh, beg or borrow or get something done. Because in my field, it's a hands and people thinking and being in the lab and doing experiments, which is really the, what takes things forward. Liz, similar thoughts for you? Yes, and, um, uh, and Bob said you can often find a piece of equipment. Often, often you know, a, a quite heavy capital um, investment in, in some large, you know, some, you know, something in our field, you know, to do with omics, right? So, gives you, you know, a lot of possibilities that then many different creative people in different labs can be using. And so, um, and, and that'll open up a whole lot of doors to avenues of investigation that you just never could have dreamed of before. You know, some of these single cell technologies and some of these very long sequencing reads, just, you know, that just to name a couple of things that are going on now where that investment is, is really going to, you know, make a whole lot of things happen that wouldn't have happened before. And then we'll see where that gets gets you. But nothing will replace 
the um, you know the drive and creativity of of the scientists in deciding how to use those pieces of equipment. Yeah, there's nothing better to get something really advanced in science than to invent a really effective and wonderful piece of equipment that costs a zillion dollars, and then to have a whole bunch of scientists that are well trained and, and educated that all want to do that process and don't give them any money. And they'll figure out some way to make that happen really cheaply because they want to do that and they know it can happen. And so I won't say, don't quote me on this, but there's an advantage to showing it's possible and then having a lot of really creative people try and make it happen cheaply. Um, this is being recorded, Andy, you know. <laughs> um, okay. We, ha we have a question from Ed that I think is, it, it is great for our audience who are a lot of students in our audience. They wanted to have an example or an insight into the kind of technologies you had when you started in your career. So maybe you can think about a technology you had and a way you do it now, right? How, what a big contrast is. Bob, do you wanna speak to that? Like what's something that you yeah. did when you were first starting? Yeah, yeah, in my field, you know, the key is being able to determine the structure that you make, the structure of the molecule that you make and how it's changed. And there's, there's, a, there's a field called nuclear magnetic resonance, which is a standard tool now, which allows us to do an experiment and assign the structure usually rather rapidly and know exactly what's going on. That was in the very primitive stages when I started. And so watching how fast we can do experiments now compared to then is just amazing. So that's really been the technology in my field that's really changed how we do things. It's the, it's the, the, the structural characterization using NMR and to a certain extent, X-ray crystallography. Again, that was a yeah. very primitive thing that took weeks and weeks and weeks to get a structure done. And now you can do them in hours on a basically no crystals at all. So it's a, so, so the structural characterization and being able to know what you've done in an experiment, uh, the feedback really is much, much faster and it allows us to do many more things. Elizabeth? What in, what technologies did you have when you were first starting out? Well, the um, technologies for sequencing DNA barely existed when I started out looking at the telomeric DNA sequences, and uh, and so it was a matter of you know using very cumbersome radioactive labeling of molecules, you know, with enzymes or chemicals in um, you know in the individual test tubes almost, and. Uh, and then, you know, separating out the oligonucleotides, the small fragments that you generated by various methods, by very cumbersome, um, you know, heavy duty equipment that involved large electrophoresis tanks with gallons and gallons of um, uh, inert organic fluid to cool them. It was just extraordinary <laughs> stuff now. And now I think about DNA sequencing and it's just totally transformed. But another thing I remembered as a skill that I had, which would be completely useless, that I would never think of using now, was the ability to draw out glass pipettes using a flame into yes. a very, very long, yeah. fine tip. So you could pick up individual tetrahymena cells. You know, now I would think of doing it, you know, on plates and use Poisson distribution to get single cells in wells. And, you know, I just wouldn't think of doing that. But I used to be able to pull a really good glass tip, and I do not think that's a useful <laughs> skill right now. Andy, what, what's, you, what's an example that you used to do that you don't currently? Well, pulling glass needles was also a thing, but we still do it, actually. In the <laughs> yeah. for oh, metro okay, Andy, I'm coming to your lab. You to recruit Elizabeth into your lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the gels were amazing, and, and used to they used to be set up some a class, a, colleague of mine in graduate school here in Michigan would set up a gel and then go away and, you know, drink coffee and hang out at the coffee shop for five hours until midnight when the thing was done and you came back and it's either completely broken and trashed or you could actually finish your experiment. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of experimentation that it required relatively difficult input, but you got amazing things out. And I'm sure when Liz saw that first DNA sequence telomere and it was repeated thing over and over again, that must have been a beauty to behold on the, you know, whatever the, whatever the device that, that showed it would, would be. And maybe even more beautiful that it took, you know, weeks and weeks or months and months to actually get the sequence done of it. So, yeah. 
Uh, Liz, we have a, a question on a slightly different topic from Kayla, which is really uh, trying to think about the ways in which technology um, has affected mental health for graduate students, either in a positive way or in a negative way from the kind of pace of research and or the just sheer amounts of data in the world. Thoughts on that, the way it's kind of uh, uh, a sort of a whole new pace of, of thought and research and particularly the effect on trainees. Well, well I'm, I'm no expert in mental health. I collaborate with people who <laughs> do have expertise on this. But, but I'll say something, you know, when I look at how children are growing up now, they, they're growing up with brains that are now getting all sorts of fascinating inputs that we didn't have. And I remember reading things that people, um, when reading started to happen, you know, things started happening in the processing in our brains. So I'm wondering if we're actually creating a new, almost a new species of humans now, because our brains, uh, that is those of those who are growing up, are really being um, able to do things in ways that we didn't do. You know, the term digital native is, is lightly used, but I, I think it's a fascinating experiment we're doing. So I actually look on it rather, rather hopefully and, and think, look, you know, humanity did a lot when reading became part of what we do. Now we're doing something which is even more fancy because there's a great deal of visual and um, oral as well as, you know, words in, in high, you know, the sort of technologies that we just use. So, yeah, let's, let's, let's see. I mean, it can become wearing, talking of mental health. Yes, it, it can become exhausting. But, you know, how many of us used to read under our bed covers at night when our parents had said, go to sleep, go to sleep, and we just wanted to keep reading all night? <laughs> so, you know, we'll, we'll see. I'm not super pessimistic. Um, we have a kind of follow-up question about uh, the question we had on ethics before, and it's, I think, really... I'll direct it at Andy first. Balashri asks, how do we bring the wider public into debates is just changing the germline, given how many misconceptions there are in the general public? Like, how would you approach that communications um, conundrum? It's a really good question. I, I don't, I mean, I don't really know the answer of how to fully bring everybody into the same conversation, but we can start by just explaining the science behind it as well as we can. Um, and trying to also a little bit cool down some of the temperature around um, the capabilities are there um, and we're not about to do anything that's going to make to make transgenic people or change anything at the moment. But I do think that I think that starting the conversation now will be a benefit. And if people understand that the conversation is just starting, maybe it will bring a lot more diverse group of individuals and, and, and perspectives into the conversation. But that's to, that's a that's a hand wavy answer to the to the to the to the point that I don't really know. Well, Robert and Elizabeth, do you have thoughts about how you engage the public about your science, right? When when thinking about how we're moving forward and increasing understanding. This Robert, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. You know, it's it's. You try to do it. I spend very little time actually doing it. Uh, when when asked, I try to explain things. But uh, you know, we you know the the institute uh, uh, has lots of advertising things, and they try to put stuff in easy ways for the public to understand. And so I think that's important. Uh, and giving you know some public lectures along the way to try to explain what we're doing and where it has applications and why it's good to sort of understand this exotic reaction that we started working on and where it can lead. So I think those are the important things that we're trying to transmit. Uh, Bob, I had, a, I had another question for you on balancing certain things. Uh, and this has to do with thinking about technology and uh, the fact that things have gotten, of course, remarkably sophisticated. And so when you're working with your students, to, to what extent do you want them to really understand deeply the technology they're using? Like what in the world a multi-dimensional NMR is actually measuring versus just getting the result from an instrument and 
and taking the interpretation as is. Yeah, I think part of the thing is is that there's so many so many things that a student has to use now is you want them to be able to understand it in enough depth so they don't uh, do stupid things, but you can't expect them to be sort of detailed in, in, in the all, all the background stuff. And so I used to, uh, when, when I was running our NMR facility, I used to describe the people as being mechanics and drivers. And uh, so you want your students to be drivers. They don't have to understand how to go in and change the spark plugs and do everything else, but you want them to understand enough about how things function and work so they don't do stupid stuff. A good yeah, analogy think, uh, there. Understanding the pitfalls is probably the most important aspect mm -hmm. of, of using a technology. Uh, yeah. So so there does have to be some real conversation between the drivers and the mechanics uh, yes, yeah. uh, to understand where the limits are and where where you can be misled. So Nate asked a question um, that again speaks to some of what we talked about in our recorded session. Um, how often do you unplug and to think deeper about things, right? How often do you step away from technology and, and spend time thinking? Um, Robert, you wanna speak to that? Uh, you know, as I've gotten older, that gets easier. Uh, you know, I don't have the pressures I had when I was younger. And so I can spend a little more time daydreaming and. Uh, and then thinking about stuff and, you know, but also I think the other important part of, 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 of being, at least for me and I've noticed for students, is that you think about stuff all the time. So you're driving and, you know, you have an idea or your thing comes up and, you know, I was recently, uh, you know, visiting my doctor and sitting in the thing thinking, and I came up with, I think it's quite a good idea. And so, and, and so you don't have to sort of say, I'm, I'm going to go sit down and have a good idea is that you, your brain is always working. And, and, you know, when I was really into things and if, uh, if someone asked a question that I hadn't thought about, I realized I was working too hard. And mm. it is spend more time thinking about things. And so, so, so I think that's another way to sort of think about, uh, how to sort of regulate what you're doing. But I think the key is yeah, just, really you know, this, yeah, yeah is, is to have your brain on and, you know, let it work for a short period of time and then you do other stuff and then it's, again, you know, it can lead to some bad driving and various other things, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, how do you Elizabeth approach it? How do you across approach across the Bay Bridge. Yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> I want to do that. Elizabeth, how do you approach like taking time away from technology to, to think? Well, I, as Bob said, I love, I love thinking. And, and sometimes if you're doing something else, you almost have to kind of say to yourself, this is not the time to be thinking of science. And to Bob's point about driving, I remember once driving over the Bay Bridge, you know, a lot of traffic, and I was coming home from work, and I really needed to stop myself from trying to solve a marvelous problem. It was about the symmetry of a palindromic molecule and how the chromatin was arranged on it. And suddenly I figured out a way that I could use enzymes to see whether this molecule was truly symmetrical at the chromatin level as well as at the DNA level. And I was on the Bay Bridge and I had to just sort of say, no, no, I can't think about this right now because I've got to drive and get <laughs> so, um, so I think, one of the things is um, also not thinking about it. So, you know, if you go, I don't know, do something and you're just completely not thinking about science, but your brain is doing fascinating processes and sometimes things oh, yeah. will bubble yeah. up. And I think that kind of thinking is probably very important in, in science. And we've all heard stories about, you know, how people were dreaming and then had an idea and so forth. So it's just that part of the science is just so much part of your life that, that it takes over all, all times. David, do you want to close us out? Sure. I'll just uh, finish with uh, one last question, which is kind of, it's, a, it's thinking about how technology aids in terms of uh, cooperation with people at a distance and, and uh, in other countries. And I guess the question is, is this creating real useful collaborations or is their progress still hindered by by kind of fierce competition between people to be 
first to first to get an answer. And I'll I'll, I'll put Andy on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think when when you talk about international work, I think one of the things that um, is not understood very well by leadership in the public is the degree to which science really is an international endeavor. And if you start thinking about a problem, the automatic thing that you do is to want to talk to the person who's the expert in it. And that means that person could be here or elsewhere. And that's been a wonderful part of technology, although the phone was great, but Zoom and email and Slack and all these things are also wonderful ways to communicate. But I do worry that some of the current and reasonable thoughts about protecting the intellectual property here, it's not about property mostly in science, it's about sharing things and making things that can be shared and will be beneficial to everybody. And I think that it will be important to realize that moving forward and not to not to build walls, but to, to build bridges. All right, well, I think given the time that we have, um, we'll take our session Q&A here to a close. Um, and many thanks again to our our esteemed laureates for uh, providing the, the not just the, the interesting session before this on technology, but being able to take some live questions from our audience. And uh, we look forward to uh, the rest of our program together. So many thanks. Thank you. Thank you.